Do you curse on the golf course? Does it help your play? Does it hurt your play? Let's tee it up. Welcome to Data Access Golf, your home for rapid golf improvement. And now, from the thin air of the Rocky Mountains, next on the number one tee, your host, Aaron Stewart. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of Data Access Golf. Appreciate you being here. Always do. It is an interesting topic today. It's one that's sort of been back in the news lately. It's kind of been away for a while. I think because uh, Tiger Woods has been away for a while. It's probably, it is not a coincidence that uh, cursing is now a topic of discussion in 2018 because Tiger Woods has returned. He has always been known to have a bit of a um, fiery mouth and he lets things fly and they have been picked up on camera in the past, which is, yeah, which is, I guess it, it is what it is. And that's Tiger Woods saying stuff, right? Um, but it's come up this year because in there was nine different FCC complaints made in 2018 about live golf. Nine. So is that a lot? That's a good question. Is that a lot? Is that pretty common for um, a year of golf? The answer is no, at least, at least not in the recent history. In 2017, we had zero. In 2016, there was zero. And then in 2015, there was two occasions. So over the course of the last three years, we've averaged less than one. And then in 2018, you have nine. One of the, the, the big contributors to that was Justin Thomas. He was quite excited after his, at his win at the Honda. Um, he went kind of crazy there for a little bit. But uh, yeah, so that brings up the question, why do we swear? And that goes back... I've thought about cursing for a long time, and it's way before golf for me. It, golfing and swearing kind of go together. I think it's Mike Leach that says he goes to play golf to practice his swearing, which is uh, funny. But, um, but yeah, this swearing and cursing and all of that, it kind of became sort of, it grew to be important to me, but I didn't know why. I grew, I grew, up, in a fam, I grew up in a family that cursing is quite accepted. My, at least on my father's side, definitely not on my mother's side, but on my father's side, they are a bunch of, of farmers from rural Nevada. And that's, they had a very harsh growing up. My grandpa and his, and his uncle sort of settled that part of Nevada. And so they had a very tough upbringing and were, um, became more polished later on in life when they were super successful. But before then they were probably a little rough around the edges. And so they, um, they swore a little bit, but not not the super grotesque, offensive swear words. They're kind of more of the, the SDH and sometimes son of a B type folks, right? So those were kind of the four main ones. They didn't really get into the uh, taking the Lord's name in vain. Uh, you know, the GDs and the, um, and the F words. None of that ever came up from my great uncles. And, and frankly, never, none of those have come from my family, or we stick away, we kind of stuck with those four, right? The four basic ones. And um, so I was kind of raised that way. I definitely did not think that it was okay to swear, but it was definitely a situation where if you did happen to hurt yourself or whatever, hit a really bad golf shot, they tended to sort of sneak out, just kind of the way you were raised, didn't really think much about it. The first time I really thought to myself, you know what, I should change this, it happened in Japan, interestingly enough. I, had, I was a missionary for the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter-day Saints, and I was called to serve in Japan. So I was over there, you know, the white shirt and tie, the suit, the whole thing. And I'm in Japan. I've been in about, about three months, and we rode bikes everywhere. That was our mode of transportation was bicycles. And so I am on this bike. You ride on the opposite, right? They, they drive on the opposite side of the street than we do here in the United States. So I'm on my bike. And I'm on the left side of the street and I'm cruising along and I've got cars coming on my right. And it's so tight in Japan that the side view mirrors are clipping my handlebars. Like, so they're just kind of tapping me as they go by and they're honking all the time. So I was, I was a stressed out wreck riding a bicycle around in Japan. I was on edge. Anyway, I was riding along. I came around a corner. I kind of forgot which side of the road I was supposed to be on. 
And so I went to the right side and then right in front of me, there was a car just bearing down on me. And so I completely freaked out, ran my bike up onto a curb kind of thing down into like a bush thing. And I, I screamed out, you know, the S word, just let it fly. Well, as a, you know, a missionary, a representative of the, of the church and of, of Christ, <laughs> we're trying to live with, uh, we're not trying to do those things, right? You're trying to be polished and calm. You're trying to be obedient. You're trying to uh, spread the word of the gospel. You're not trying to say, you know, curse and, and upset people. Now we're in Japan. Nobody probably knew what I was saying anyway, except I, I stood there and you're, you're always, you know, you're always in twos as missionaries. And so my trainer who happened to be from Idaho, thankfully, he um, kind of heard this, saw the whole thing, heard it. And so when I kind of got my bearing and kind of got up and looked at my bike and figured out what had gone on, I'd kind of fallen off and whatever I got up, it hit me. It hit me that I had let the S word fly. And I, that's not what we do as missionaries. And I was like, oh, darn it. You know, I shouldn't have done that. I looked up at him. His face was kind of pale. His color, color kind of drained a little bit. And we looked at each other. And I was just trying to think to myself, oh, my word, what in the world is he going to do? And he started to laugh. And then I started to laugh. We kind of let it go. It was no big deal, right? We kind of, it was just one of those things. But I realized, okay, I'm in a situation where I don't want to do this. And then something happens and I just blurt it out. I didn't think about it, nothing. It was just there. And I thought that was really interesting. I, I didn't want it to happen. I, I tried not to let it happen. I, I, and then boom, it was just there without me thinking about it. So I didn't like that. I didn't like the fact that I didn't have control over this word that came flying out of my mouth. I, I, I thought that was a little odd. So that was kind of my first experience with it. My next experience was, um, so our, our oldest son is now 19, but when he was in third grade, he was at school and I guess the kids kind of got together and they were stop and they were, you know, they were discussing how many swear words they knew. I, I don't know why, right? We don't, we don't know why kids do these things. So they're amongst themselves in a little group and they're talking and they're like, do you know, you know, they're going through the whole thing and they're like, do you know the S word? Do you know that? Do you know the S word? Do you know the S word? Back and forth, back and forth. And the kids are talking and, and Canyon goes, yeah, I know the S word. I'm like, yeah, you don't know the S word. You don't know the S word. Come on, say it then. If you really know it, you should say it. And he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't, he wouldn't. Again, this is from my third grader telling me the story. But eventually they're like, oh, you got it. You got to say it, whatever. You don't know. You don't know it. You don't know it. So he goes, he, he lets the S word go. Well, instantly, right? The kids go running, tell the teacher, Canyon swearing. And after the principal, he goes, we get called in. We're down at the principal's office. And now we're talking to Canyon like, okay, what's going on? Right now, I've been careful. I tried to be careful around the house, especially when they're little, because, ah, you know, I just don't want that to go. Occasionally, yeah, it happened, and, and it wasn't the best, but I really, really tried not. And I, I just don't really remember, and this particular word was one that I didn't use very frequently at home at all. It was more of my, that's, that's what is always my, kind of my favorite word on the golf course. I didn't really use it at home. So I was like, mm, I don't know where he got this. And so I made the mistake. And again, young fathers out there just never do this. The kids are so honest and so great. But we're in the office and I said, yeah, I don't know where he learns it. I, he may have heard his grandpa say it, I think is what I said exactly. He probably heard his grandpa say it, to which Canyon then stops me and turns to me and goes, no, dad, it was when you were fixing the computer. So yeah, there's that. So I realized, okay, that's again, not cool. I do remember the times when we, you know, the internet was getting going, we had, we had modems. And we just got DSL, which was just like the latest, greatest, cool thing, right? Because you could have like one megabit a second up and down where, you know, I think I'm getting 500 megabits a second right now. So, so it wasn't working. I remember the call. I remember being frustrated. I had to get some work done and it just didn't work. And so, uh, yeah, I let a cursor. So there's another time where I didn't want it to happen and it did. And I was frustrated and I let it fly and my poor child heard it. And then he got in trouble later because of it. And I don't want that either, right? So there's, there's number two in my life that I can remember. And the third time is by far the most poignant to me. So I had, um, again, it was with my oldest son, unfortunately, this poor, this poor kid had to suffer through my parenting woes. But we're, we're, we're talking, I, I'm expressing some discomfort with him and some of his choices, and I'm encouraging him to not do any of these types of things again. And I called him a name, and it starts with S. And um, he stopped me and he said, Dad, when you use that word, I get scared. I'm like, you know what? That sucks. 
I don't want my child to be scared of me. I don't want to elicit that emotion from him. I'm trying to, I'm trying to teach him something. I'm trying to do something good here. I use that word and now he's scared. Learning and growing is not done very well from a scared place, right? From a fearful spot is not the best way to go. So there's three. And I said to myself, you know what? And this was not, he was not a young kid. He was 16 or 17. So this is just a few years ago. And I thought, you know what? That's it. I'm just done with this. Actually, he was probably 15 it was before he's driving. So it was 15. So it's four years ago. And I'm like, you know what? I'm done. I'm out. I'm, cursing is over for me. I'm going to figure out how to stop this thing. And so I dug in and I did some research is, is typical of me. So I went and I said, okay, what are, what, first of all, why in the world am I swearing when I don't want to swear? When it's not really what I want to do, but it happens occasionally. So you go on and you dig in and you do a little research. Well, it turns out that there is a reason that we can swear without thinking about it. It's because swear words, and I'll go into a little bit. I hope I don't get too geeky here and I, I apologize if I do, but swear words, interestingly, interestingly enough, through research, they have been able to see, researchers have found that swear words are actually stored in both sides of our brain, the left and the right hemisphere. The right hemisphere being the emotional part of our brain where we remember we've got memories and negative thoughts and all those sorts of things. And then the left side of our brain, brain being the part where we actually you know, our, our disciplined language forming, thinking, you know, analytical, right? We've got the left and right hemispheres of our brain. So they work. So they have actually gone through new, using neuroimaging and, and looked at a brain and then actually had swear words go. And, and based on the emission and the topography of the brain, they've, they found that the amygdala, which is the part of the brain that controls sort of fight or flight, it's a really sort of primitive part of the brain, but that's what generates our fight or flight. So when somebody hears a swear word or says a swear word, it, it generates a response in that part of the brain where fight or flight is triggered. Okay. So when my son is telling me, dad, I get scared. Yeah, you do get scared because a primitive part of your brain just fired off and, and you're scared now. That's just a natural reaction to this. These, these words are emotional. They've learned over time that these are bad words. You shouldn't say them. We've beat it into them as a society that these are acceptable words and these are not. And so that's part of both sides of our brain. We can, we can create sentences using swear words and we can also just blurt them out because they're just over here in the emotional part of our brain and they're tied to um, emotion. They're tied to memories, but they're just hanging out of here, just available at any time. And so they've gone and looked even further. They looked into uh, like Tourette's, people that suffer from Tourette's. And there's sort of a weird thing that we believe from TV shows and stuff that all Tourette's, all Tourette's um, victims have absolutely no control over. And they just swear, completely have no control on, on swear words. And that's not true. Only 10 to 10 to 25 percent of, of folks with Tourette's actually use curse words. So that's not they use my other words and have other ticks. But that's not really what was very interesting in this research. But there is another part of the research that, that focused on aphasia, which is aphasia is a when the left side of your brain, especially the language portion of your brain, doesn't work anymore, right? So they've been able to find people who have this aphasia where they have damage or that part of the left hemisphere, the left side of the, the left hemis hemisphere of the brain isn't working. And, and these people cannot form sentences. They cannot speak well. They have a hard time putting everything together, but they can still swear like sailors. They have access, perfect access to all the swear words. The swear words take absolutely, because it's in the right side of the brain, saved in both sides, they can use swear words perfectly because it's tied and put someplace else. It's in the emotional part of the brain and it just sits there and it's available at any time without much thought. Just boom, you can have it. So there you go. So there's another, there's another aspect of swearing. So it just sits there. So me being com completely freaked out that sometimes when something happened, I would let a swear word go. Well, swear words are tied to negative emotion and trigger negative memories. So boom, ah, something happens, you let one of those go. Unless you stop using those words, they're just going to be available to you. We know that when we stop using certain things in our brain, the synapsis of that starts to close up. It doesn't, it's not as efficient to fire there anymore. So eventually you can get rid of that part of your brain if you work on it, if you change it, if you reprogram yourself. So that's what I've been doing the last four and a half, five years is working on that. But then 
as I started to think about the purpose behind not swearing, I actually had my reasons, right, for to be a better father, to communicate properly, to not be the kind of person that makes their child fear, fearful when they're trying to talk to them. But as I think about all this now and we bring it into golf, and I'm sorry, we're 15 minutes into this. I'm just barely getting back to golf. I use this, um, these benefits somewhat lightly because in the research it says this can be some benefits. And anytime a researcher says this can be a result of swearing, it means that they really don't have the data and they're just using their opinion. And unfortunately, the modern day, and I'm using air quotes, researcher goes here a lot where they've run tests and the fact that they've run tests somehow or another, they're an expert. And so they make up some opinions based on the research they did, but the data doesn't support their opinions and their conclusions. And this was kind of one of those studies, but we'll go with it anyway. So I'm just going to say here, here's some of the reasons, the purposes of us swearing based on research. It releases tension. Okay. Whatever. People who swear have shown to have increased pain tolerance. Okay. Whatever. Uh, to get noticed. Yeah, we've seen that, right? You can see people swearing to just get noticed. Those And to express dis displeasure, duh, right? We all know that. Okay, the problem with this list of four, release tension, increase pain tolerance, get noticed, and express displeasure, every single one of those as to the positive effects of swearing is completely selfish. It's 100% about me, 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 and that's it. That's a problem. So now we're going to talk about on the golf course. I can see maybe releasing tension being okay, increased pain toler tolerance, eh, whatever. To get noticed, I don't know. That doesn't seem to be um, very interesting. To express displeasure, yeah, you hit a bad shot, right? You let one go. Just kind of let everybody know that you knew it was a bad shot so they don't have to say anything to you. So you let one fly, get it. But now here's the problem. There are some, these are very, very selfish reactions to a situation. And I go back to my discussion with my son and that he felt fearful. Well, when somebody swears, it elicits a response from us that we can't really control. It's built inside of us, right? The amygdala freaks out and it triggers a fight or flight response in us. So if you think about it as you're playing with your friends, if you let out an expletive and you're triggering that in them and they don't really want that, do you, nobody wants to play golf with this fear aspect to it, right? Nobody wants to play golf fearfully. Nobody wants to play golf in the fight or flight place. I don't. And yet somebody's now cursing and sort of forcing that on me. It's, it's kind of a bully move. It's a super selfish bully move to swear out loud and put your playing companions into that. It's completely selfish, period. You are doing them no good. So I think it's just bad manners. So one reason to not swear on the golf course, just straight up bad manners bad etiquette. I do think that somehow or another, we talk about Tiger's intimidation factor and he used to hit it longer and all that, but he also swore like a sailor and, and he was putting his playing partners in a very uncomfortable spot because he was using some of the foulest words available to man. And, and that was then triggering in his playing partners who may or may not play with others who swear like that in a very difficult place. Unfairly so. It's cheating almost to do that to another person. Now, can we control that? Yeah, there's ways to do that going on. But I'm just saying, if you look at it that way, it's kind of creepy. To swear on the golf course is kind of a selfish, bullish tactic. Really to swear anywhere at somebody and put them into that place is kind of, it's awful. Okay, so the next thing. When you swear and when you let one fly like that, you're accessing a part of your brain that's very emotional and it's very negative and it's very associative. So any bad shot, let's say if I hit one in the water and I let an expletive fly, the next time I let that expletive go, it's associated with the previous bad shot. Now I'm remembering every bad shot, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, I've accessed that part of my brain. Now every bad shot that I've hit and, and let that expletive go is now available to me and the emotion and everything else behind it. So just trying to play good golf and swearing doesn't make any sense. Why in the world would you access all that negative energy, all the negative memories just for hitting a bad shot? You don't want any of that. One, because we can't play from the past anyway. Recreating some kind of a feel from a past hit is ridiculous. We're creating. We want to have new thoughts, positive thoughts, right? So that's why we need to keep, we, have, we cannot swear. 
it's just not good for our golf game. So that's a selfish reason in and of itself. It's unselfish not to share because you're putting your, your playing companions into some sort of fight or flight place in a fearful place. And then don't swear for yourself because you're accessing a bunch of negative thoughts and feelings that you don't want on the golf course. Nobody wants that. Let's say you're now playing and you've got somebody who's got a foul mouth and you know now that this is going to trigger this response in you, this fight or flight. Well, you have to change that somehow. Now, for me, I know that uh, somebody, when I see somebody who curses, like just lets one fly, where it's obviously they, they haven't put a thought together, right? They've just kind of lazy thought or not thinking at all, and they've let a swear word go. First thing I think of, I, I kind of feel bad for them because it shows to me that they have no self-mastery over that part of their life. And I know how that feels. I have sworn in places where I didn't want to swear. And, and that's not a good feeling. To, to not have self-control is not a, a good feeling. So I, I, my response is, I feel really bad for that person who's cursing. I do. And that generates a different feel in me. Now, I don't feel fear or flight. I feel empathy. I feel bad for them. And so that's really helped me play with folks that have foul mouths. I don't get this fight or flight anymore. I realize what's going on. I've analyzed it enough and I've thought about this enough where my reaction is now one of empathy. I feel bad that this person is a lazy thinker, has allowed that swear word to shoot out, has never worked on trying to reduce the synapses so it doesn't work, and now they are simply a slave to a habit that is hurting their golf game. I also feel like I've got a much better chance of beating this person if they're swearing right? Because they've accessed some very negative thoughts in their brain. And if I was super cruel, I would probably just say that swear word from that point forward and try to help them generate those negative thoughts going forward if I really wanted to beat them, right? Because that's how it works. All that being said, I would recommend don't swear. It's just better for your golf game. If you don't swear, you don't access, you don't associate a bad word with bad shots, and you've probably said the same bad word for bad shots for years, and you want to get rid of it. Quit swearing. Don't access those thoughts anymore. Don't access those memories anymore. Just be done with it. And then the other reason to not swear is you're being a bully. You're being a jerk, and you're forcing your playing companions who have not maybe developed some techniques to deal with that into a fight-or-flight response, into a fearful place, and now they have to play golf from there thanks to you and your selfishness and your inability to control your mouth, your, your lack of self-mastery. You have now screwed over your playing companions and you've put yourself in a bad place. So what's the point? So there you have it. A little preachy today. I apologize. It's supposed to be a feel-good Friday and I went into cursing. So anyway, with the topic of Justin Thomas, I hope you know 2019 is a better year for this. With live golf, that was kind of the comment from Golf Channel. They're like, hey, with a live event, what do you do? You know, there's no way we can do anything. Although with Tiger Woods, you should probably always have him on a delay. With that, don't swear to improve your golf game. Don't swear to improve the um, relationship with your playing partners. Don't swear to allow them to play to the very best of their ability. Right? Do that for them and do it for yourself. There you go. No cursing on the golf course in 2019 and no white belts. Hope you have a great weekend. Thank you for listening. As always, better data. Right, even on how the mind works playing golf, better data always means better golf. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Data Access Golf with Aaron Stewart. Check us out online at dataaccessgolf.com, and we'll see you on the next episode.